we've got another test we want to share with you. We're going to do rice again. Uh, but this time, we're going to do just a little bit different. Before we get started, let me share with you Coulter Wilson. Check it out below. I've put the link in there for his homebrewing DIY, the homebrewing do-it-yourself podcast. Uh, very, very interesting, and I think you'll really enjoy it. And oh, by the way, Barley and Hops Brewing is episode 12. Well, first I want to welcome everybody back. I'm George. This is Barley and Hops. And of course, if you get that opportunity, subscribe. Hit the bell. You get the notifications. Look, that's the only recognition we get. So for all of you brewers, distillers, beer makers, oh gosh, wine makers, oh, bake light oven operators, I, I mean, everybody who gains anything from this channel, we say a heartfelt thank you. And keep sending the comments or give me a call, send me an email, you know the routine. Now, I got a call not long ago, um, shortly after I actually published that video about converting rice to fermentable sugars uh, with amylase. And uh, we had a very, very great conversation. And I, I really appreciated it, oh, by the way. The guy, he went around the, uh, around the bin about trying to say, George, you're wrong. So I said, well... Anything could, anything's possible. Nobody's an expert. So uh, I, what I did is after this long conversation, I committed to him. I said, I'll do it again. So uh, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I'm just prepared now. But his point was, he said that, well, you need to use glucoamylase along with alpha amylase. And I'm like, well, okay. So let me tell you how I set this up this time so that we can be all, in all fairness and lay it out. And if I'm wrong, I'll say so. Uh, and if I'm right, I'll be as gentle as I possibly can. Now, but you, you never know. Here's what we have, okay? I put 200 grams of boiled rice in each one of these containers. Uh, with, these are quart jars. Now, th th these two are 155 degrees right now. And I've actually filled them up equally with water. So I've got 200 grams in each one filled up with water. This one is fermenting temperature right at about 75-ish. Uh, th this is my pot that I heated these up in. So they were, I used a water bath to make sure that this was a constant temperature. And I maintained that temperature in here. Now, what will happen is, is I'm going to introduce amylase. Um, and then I'm going to put these back in here and allow them to set at 155 degrees. Uh, for 90 minutes. Now, first of all, most amylase activity, amylazistic activity, I, I, I made up that word before, um, most of it takes place in about the first 20 minutes. But, but I always say, look, we just give it a full 90 minutes and let it, let it run its course. Uh, so we're going to wait 90 minutes and then we'll bring it back out and cool it down. Uh, and what will happen then is uh, I'll, I'll only need to test one to find out if we've got any fermentable sugars because we've used the amylase. Uh, in the second one, I'll, so, and I'll leave that one alone, I'll put amylase uh, in this one as well at fermenting temperature just as a base. Now, as a matter of fact, we'll skip that. I'm just going to put glucoamylase in here. Um, and in this one, when we get it cooled down, I will introduce the glucoamylase because you use glucoamylase, which you know, the beta you got alpha amylase, and then you got beta amylase. Uh, beta amylase is sold under the name of gluco, glucoamylase. And I'm going to introduce that into here and allow that to do its thing. Now, um, let's understand what the differences between alpha and beta are. You know, alpha does a real good job of chopping up all of those, starch, or those starches yeah, and, and breaking them down to fermentable sugars, or glucose, glucose, fructose, sucrose, uh, and, and all those other coses. Um, and then what the uh, glucoamylase does is breaks it off at the 1,4 chain. It, it kind of clips the ends of some of those complex sugars and it actually produces, or the results are single molecule glucose um, molecules. Yeah, glucose. And uh, glucose is the most fermentable. Actually, the yeast go for that first. So it's used to enhance um, your brewing uh, or your mash making or whatever the case may be. My opinion is that because of the amount that we're doing, if I was doing 10,000 gallons, let me tell you what, one to three percent, 
of non-fermentable sugars that I can rescue makes a big difference. In five gallons, totally up to you. So you can use glucoamylase if you like. I, I routinely don't. Uh, it's just that one extra step that I, I, I don't really gain any massive benefit from. But from this one, I'm supposed to. Let's give that a go. Now, I'm going to do the introduction now. So this is 0.1 to 0.3 tablespoons, or I'm sorry, teaspoons per gallon. So this should only take a very, very little, uh, but I'm going to make sure that I put enough in here for at least, to at least convert this and put equal amounts. So I'm going to use about a fifth of this teaspoon. And then I'm going to introduce the same amount. Oh, by golly. I'm going to introduce the same amount in this one. There we go. And as well, nope, that's right, we weren't going to put it in that one. Okay, because that one's at fermentation temperature. And I am going to replace these back into my stock pot that's going to maintain them at that temperature. <laughs> Check my time. Okay, I got my time. Replace these. And I've just got these sitting in that a colander in there that sets it, it's an offset from the bottom. And uh, we'll allow that to set for a while. Now, now interestingly enough, I uh, just got to tell you what I've been up to. Couldn't help it. Had to go back. Uh, and I'm still in search of, I'm looking hard. I'm trying to find somebody that ain't doing nothing. And I want to help them. We'll be back. Okay, I have returned. Now, it has been several hours. Uh, because when I conducted this test, I wanted to make sure there wasn't any outside influences whatsoever. And we're still puzzled. Um... I allowed this to cool from the 155 degrees I maintained it at for 90 minutes. I allowed it to cool naturally. So it's been, a and you know how long that could potentially take. Uh, just good thing it's only a quart jar. All right, now, uh, this was the one. This is, of course, uh, no heat whatsoever, just rice in the water. And, of course, that measured at 1.000. That's And that was expected. Um, both of these measured, uh, and I used a hydrometer, on this, on this test, I used a hydrometer. On the other one, I used a refractometer. Uh, with a hydrometer, I measured 1.010. So I did get a reading. Now, um, the jury is still out um, because of the following information. Now, and again, we're still in the search of a final resolution, and I hope we get there. Um, I tasted this um, after I measured it. I was like, okay, there then apparently there is some conversion. So I tasted it and I can detect not one iota of any sweetness whatsoever. So I said, well, maybe, I'm, and I'm thinking out loud outside the box. And again, using a hydrometer gave me a little bit more of a challenge as opposed to a refractometer. Um, and I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, it was the thickness or the viscosity of that water that was filled with all those starches. That's, that, that there's a potential there, okay? So there, this may be a case of we're both right or um, we're both out there in left field. Um, here's what I do know, though. I've added the glucoamylase to this one, and I think it's probably rational to, to expect that if there was some conversion and glucoamylase cuts off the number one and four chains, that there should be an increase in gravity, don't you think? So if, if I drop this hydrometer back into this solution, and I'm going to give it overnight, tomorrow, and it's higher than 1.010, um, well then it's clear that there is some sort of conversion taking place. Uh, if I drop my hydrometer in there and it reads the same thing, well then, I can ascertain at that point that my theory was right, that it's the, or my assumption was right, that it's the viscosity of the liquid of the starches and there is absolutely no conversion. Now, um, we're gonna wait till tomorrow and you get the final on that. Now, I've, I've done all the reading. Um, 
this gentleman pointed me to a lot of different places. And in every case and everything I read, um, and on all the blogs and on Reddit and on everything else, there was always other constituents that were mixed with the I, I could not find a simple straight rice only amylase brew. Uh, everything had either another adjunct, a cereal, a green, or sugar added to it. So yes, that will ferment. Um, I'm just not, you know, this is a conundrum for us. We're gonna find out. We'll see you tomorrow. Welcome back. Yep, it's been 24 hours, so we've had plenty of time for everything that we anticipated to take place or not take place. So let's get right to it. Uh, now, we recreated the uh, initial video that I did with rice and whether amylase will convert it or not. And this is the rice with water, nothing done with it. This is sort of like my, my base. Uh, that's 1.000, just as expected. And um, then we had the rice with water, and we did add amylase to that and kept it at 155 degrees for 90 minutes. And interestingly enough, and I'll admit that, that we had 1.010. So we did have um, some activity. And then so I, I got to thinking a little bit further. I said, okay, now, the discussion we had was they used glucoamylase. And remember when we talked about this, I said that could this be the result of the hydrometer float based on other solids like starches in the water. I said, well, if I added glucoamylase and my gravity increased, well then that really points towards conversion. So that's what I did. I added glucoamylase. And today when we tested it, it came out to 1.020. So it does. Yes, I'm here to say it. We had it wrong the first time. Uh, alpha amylase, along with glucoamylase that you add at fermentation temperature, will convert starches in rice to fermentable sugars. Now, exactly how much, I've had a hard time trying to determine that, but that's not the point. Um, this is a, a perfect, not a, I wouldn't use it as a base grain, but it's a good adjunct. Now, one other thing I did, just to, I just wanted to downright just prove it that, so that we could remove all question. I thought, you know what? I had that second jar uh, with alpha and glucoamylase in it, and I went, you know, let me add some yeast. There's only one way to prove whether it's fermentable sugars or not, and that's will the yeast eat it? And you can see I've been spending most of the day with a, a microscope out. You can see there's a picture on here of a yeast colony just working its way, working its way through some sugars because we're doing some other tests. And I don't know if you heard that, I did, but there's a little puff, and I can look down inside, and you can see the activity, the bubbles popping up. So, yes, the, the, the yeast are active. Um, they're actively fermenting, so that means that there has to be fermentable sugars in here. So from this point on, to answer the question, can you convert rice to fermentable sugars using amylase alpha and gluco, and the answer to that is yes. So I will take down that first video, and this one will replace it, and my hat's off to the gentleman who got in touch with me and coaxed me into, didn't take a whole lot of effort, coaxed me into trying this again. Until next time, happy distilling.